Welcome, everyone. We are so glad that you're joining us. I'm very excited to introduce our special guest today, Dr. Steven Eisenstadt. Dr. Eisenstadt is the founder of Dream Tending, Pacifica Graduate Institute, and the Academy of Imaginal Arts and Sciences. He is a world-renowned professor of depth psychology, an imagination specialist and innovator. Welcome, Dr. Steven Eisenstadt. It's so great to have you here today. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Well, so the title of your talk is Dream Tending, Tending the Living Image. And so what do you mean by the living image? Well, it starts with the idea of dream tending. So it's not dream interpretation or dream analysis. It's the idea to tend an image as if the image was alive, is alive, which in fact it is. When the eyes close and something comes awake at night, we have these images, people, animals, creatures, landscapes, all living, interacting with one another. So to tend to a dream is to invite the living presence of those figures or landscapes to come into the room and to be reflected upon between the tender, the person that's working with somebody, and me, the person that's having the dream. So can you tell us a little more then about how dream tending is different from other approaches to dream work and you, you know, what, what makes it unique and what distinguishes it from, from other approaches? Yes. Uh, dream tending is different. Um, you know, it's out of what I would call the post Jungian school, the archetypal school. So it, it roots primarily in the autonomy of imagination, which is a big way of saying that the figures of dream come forward and have a life of their own. And to tend the dream, we don't therefore interpret the dream, make it into something that's from the rational mind. We really don't even analyze the dream. So it's not about dream interpretation. It's not about dream analysis only. It's something else. It's about really hearing into, listening, befriending the phenomenology of the dream, which is another way of saying to befriend the actuality of the images and the landscapes as they come forward and greet us. So we really host the images rather than to bring our rational minds so quickly into interpreting or analyzing. It actually, in dream tending, the idea is that the intelligence of the dream is located in the images themselves. The intelligence is located in the images, so our work is to listen to the stories that dreams come forward with, the images, the landscapes. Who's visiting now is the, the hallmark, not what does this mean, rather who's visiting now, what's happening here, right? What's the pull of the future that the dream is making the claim on our attention? So that distinguishes dream tending from the more traditional approaches to dream work. And would it be appropriate at this time to ask for any um, examples or stories that you might have to share with your work and teaching dream tending? Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, let's just come up with one that's actual and real and present. Uh, because I work with what's called Facebook Live virtually every Thursday, which is just put out into the world and people can come in and uh, work with, with dream. And the other day I had a woman who was on Facebook Live, and she was sharing a dream. It was a dream of being in a home place, and there was a tree that was growing in the backyard, and then there was something menacing approaching, and she was, like, frightened. Of course she would be. And, of course, those are the dreams of the day. So many people are having nightmarish images, images of threat, somebody intruding or an animal or a creature intruding. It's because of what we're all experiencing, both here and now with the virus, but also in contemporary culture where there is a sense of always being on edge to a certain extent. So the traditional way of working with that dream might be to understand what, what is the threat and how is that threat manifesting in the dream? And if I look at the last 24 hours of my life circumstance, what is threatening? And of course, that's an important place to visit. And the next might be, you know, in terms of my developmental history, my personal unconscious, you know, what happened when I was younger? in my development that suggested some kind of threat or actually became some kind of threat. And now something in the circumstance of the day are kind of constellating that or triggering that again. And now it's coming out in dream. And again, an important place to, to visit. 
or you know from the collective idea the idea of the collective psyche collective unconscious what is that scape what in myth or story suggests something about being chased by animal and of course we know that when animals come into story or myth um we know that there's usually something about uh, a movement going on both internally and externally animals will forever suggest that something new is about to happen and they also lead the way but it's threatening now now we can do all those things with the dream and i do i visit all those different stations but there's something else and that's the heart of dream tending and what else there is is there's a visitation that's occurring what animal is threatening and where is this occurring not just cognitively but actually so when i'm in the room or when i'm talking with this woman in the um over zoom you know and we're exploring what is this animal who is it we have to animate so we go from interpretation right to analysis into animation from association to amplification into an animation and what i mean by that and then i'll give the example is the animals visiting now who is visiting now animals here now well what kind of animal and it's not just animal like in this instance it was a a, a dog that had fangs kind of things like a wolf dog that was really threatening and coming through but if i just say that i'm generalizing and then i can go into story and i can go into idea on the other hand what about this creature is particular to this creature how is it different than any other dog any other creature like it to the extent that we get particular and we get precise now we invite that figure into the room so the you know most people will say oh no don't do that that'll just re-stimulate the the fear or the anxiety or the the disturbance but no not really to the extent that we invite that one particularly when we have a presence that's next to us that's safe and that is supportive and caring and we always want to make that move first then we sit and we notice just like a child would in child's play which is you know not just childish but very elevated quality of consciousness but we allow the figures to be in the room along with us the idea being that we're getting involved we're developing a relationship with the figure so in this instance with that creature that was so threatening but now that we're looking with support and with particularity that begins to depotentiate lessons in its in its fight and its fear and aggression we begin to look at it you know i mean what are you going to do these nightmares come if we just explain them away the does that really work not often they'll just come back the next night or the two nights later or the next month or two years later rather who is visiting now you know what's been asked of me you know what what story is needing to be told that i can listen to particular support and a sense of safety So that's what I mean when we say we're befriending the living images of the dream. Thank you for elaborating on that uh that helps me understand this process a little deeper. And you mentioned personal unconscious and um can you t- you can you tell me what you mean when you talk about world unconscious? And I'm wondering if that's similar to collective unconscious or different. That's a little different. Yeah, so traditionally you know there's three schools in the west in western psychology we have the personal unconscious the place of developmental history the place of developmental psychology you know what's happened to us since we were children how do we grow up what were the circumstances how do dreams go back and pick up those kinds of ideas of course that's the behavioral school that's also the psychoanalytic school of course the new evolution in psychoanalysis is extraordinary so but you know the tradition ideas were going back it's reductive we're trying to figure out what this dream means on the basis of what happened to us back when right we're tracking back causal the next is uh, carl jung comes along and comes up with a jungian orientation so just you know it's not all about me it's not all about my personal history there's something else at work that's influencing impacting our behavior shaping who we are and who we're becoming and of course he ascribes that to a collective unconscious the collective psyche and the contents of that would be the archetypal configurations and archetypal figures and motifs and we hear that in the great teaching stories of mythology um literature and so on so we hear a dream and we hear the dream picking up these archetypal 
forms. And then we begin to understand how those forms link to the teaching stories and what's the wisdom that's offered. That's about 98% of dream work. So we start with the circumstance of the day, how we respond, go to the personal unconscious, the developmental history, move over into a collective unconscious with archetypal configurations. Uh, that's about a, a great deal of what dream work is. Then there's another possibility, and that's the world unconscious. So from personal, collective, to the world psyche. World psyche is a little different because it's not just person-centric. For example, uh, ocean comes into dream, right? Very traditional. Water dreams are like always familiar and up a lot right now. And of course, we can go back to understanding water as something of tears, you know, and sadness, or water as generative. We can go back to water even earlier to something about womb. We can do water in myth and stories, the great, great sea journeys, you know, happen on the ocean, so on and so forth. There's something else. Ocean comes into dream. And I get curious not only about the personal and the collective implications, I get interested as well in the ocean itself, or the mountain itself, or the city itself. The figures, the creatures, the things of the world coming into the dream, speaking on behalf of themselves in the imagery of our personal dreams. So what do I mean by that? Really simple, not complicated. It's actually um, not even new. It's an indigenous insight and story, working with an animated world, a world alive, with the creatures and things, with voices of their own. And where would those voices appear? But in the images of dream. How is that important? Ocean comes now. It'll talk about its plight, its story, and it will locate in the dreams of people, right? So when I work at the United Nations, which I do, and we work with something called an Earth Charter International, working with the ecological devastation that's going on on the planet today, one idea is to work with dream. Because when we hear dream, we hear the world talking on behalf of itself, talking story through images in the dreams that visit us. And images come not only to reflect what's wrong, they also come with a generative spark. So to the extent that we can listen to the ocean speak to us is the extent to which we can hear not only the wounding, but also the healing and what's being asked of us in response. And if nothing else, just on a practical level, to the extent that we hear the creatures and the things and the oceans and the mountains and the cities in the dream, we develop a kind of curiosity and aesthetic response we get interested and we see the beauty and uh we're more sensitive to what's going on in the environment just just that is very cool but the un the united nations something that we call the global dream initiative at dream tending so that's all of this is uh, dreamtending.com you can go and learn about the global dream initiative we have people around the world contributing dreams uh, and dreams that come to them from the world place and then we listen to the world speaking on behalf of itself and then we bring it into the deliberations and the kind of conversations we're having at the united nations and that in turn contributes to what's called an earth charter which is now 20 years in the making and picking up a lot of steam in these last couple of years that's incredible. I had no idea. So I'm glad you're sharing uh, that with us today. I, I want to dive in a little deeper and talk about the, the deep imagination. And can you tell us what you mean when you talk about the deep imagination and how you view dreams as portals into the deep imagination? Right. Um, you know, the, we all experience imagination. Um, you know, we, we, it's part of our lives now because of social media and because of the movies and because of um, reading literature and storytelling and so on and so forth. Imagination is part of our life. It's more than, though, a video game, right? And it's more than simply a movie as great as they are. And the video games, as great as they are as well. You know, there's something else. There's an imagination that originates in the depth of our personal experience, and it extends out from that experience into other people's and creatures' experience. In other words, there is a dimension of awareness or consciousness that has an imaginal underpinning, that is a field of imagination. Right? And to really access 
that quality of life, that imaginal place in us, opens up an incredible intelligence. I mean, imagination, Einstein said that. He said, look, you know, it's not about my mathematics only. It's not about figuring it out only. It's about imagination. If there's one thing that I can offer to people, it is this idea that imagination encircles the world. And it's the best, if it's possible, to access that. And dreams are an access. But let's bring it into the world of today. Harvard Business School, right? This last year, they're coming out with journal articles and they're re reconstructing their curriculum in their business school because they understand the potency of imagination. With imagination comes innovation, creativity, and the good news is it's really difficult to be in imagination and be so anxious or distressed or disturbed at the same time. It's almost as if they're reciprocal inhibitors if we are in authentic imagination with support and a sense of guidance, right? Reciprocal. So people that are hurting, isolated, socially isolated in place, it's a time of creative incubation, not necessarily only social isolation, and people can access imagination. And right back to your question, Kim, the good news is that dreams offer portals into imagination. I'm going to slow it down and share that again. Dreams offer points of access. In other words, a dream will come and we can interpret it and we can understand something about ourselves, important, something about our background, important, helpful, instructive, something that we're missing during the day that attention needs to be brought. Very important. Of course it is. We can access the archetypal stories that are connected that offer their wisdom teachings, as I suggested, truly important. And two, another way to be with dream is to work with dream in such a way that we slow it down. We live inside the dream. You know, it's a living actuality dreams. They're living images. And when we see ourselves in the dream, the figure that looks like us in the dream, nine times out of 10, we imagine that's the center of the dream and everything's related to that, what's called dream ego. There's another possibility. And that is that the person or the figure that looks like us is just one of the many figures of the dream. And it originates like everything else from this place of deep imagination. And when we gain access to that, then it's possible to journey through imagination, to actually take the time to dip in, to move through the portal that the dream will open up and journey into imagination so that the dream is the beginning place. It opens the stage really it opens the realm of imagination so that we can journey and see who we meet and who in turn greets us there extraordinary truly the quality of life just goes up with the people that i work with um and as importantly you know there's a sense of well-being and i do believe in all the many 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 people that i've worked with it's the place where i get the most direct insight into my calling you know, my purpose, my life's purpose, a sense of destiny. You can really feel it and hear and experience, you know, the others that are working imagination and how they've shaped our lives. And when we're attuned in that way, um, we get a sense of our path, so to speak. Well, thank you for elaborating there as well. I have uh, yes. so so many questions for you, but I, I realize that some of our listeners may want to know how people can get started with dream tending. And so could you could you share that with us? If people want to dive in, what should they do? Where should they go? That's great. Uh, a number of ways. Um, it's a growing community. And, um, you know, for me, number one is community. So we get a community of people that appreciate dream, you know, have a certain sensitivity for imagination, a certain sensitivity on probably all their lives, you know, and now in community, they can collaborate with one another, cooperate. I offer tools and skills and ways of doing that and so on and so forth. Dreamtending.com, easy place to begin. I'm on Facebook Live almost every Thursday now. Join us there. It's free. It's open to everybody. You'll meet people from around the world, really, that are part of that. It's just a half an hour or so. And then for those people that want to take the deeper dive to really get involved with, you know, the kind of work that I'm talking about, um, I have certificate programs, program one, a program two, even now a program three. And what we do is we work with one another and then in turn we extend out so that there's so many people now that have been 
honing their skills at Dream Tenny. I've been doing this for almost 45 years now, starting with Pacifica Graduate Institute, actually. And so we have a network of people that can be mentors, that can help and support other folks. And again, I want to just underscore for the third time, community. It's so helpful to be in a community of the caring to begin with a respectful community, a community that can help hold what we call the temenos, you know, the, the sacred place, the place that is so important to help listen into dream and allow the dream to be present. And again, you know, for those folks, all of us, the very frightening dreams that kind of maybe push us away sometimes, those are the dreams that I really appreciate perhaps the most, because in that frightening dream, there's almost always a generative spark. So we take the time to really understand how to work with those dreams. And I'll just say in closing that what we do is we spend a whole time on the living image. And then we spend another module on the nightmares, like I just mentioned. And the third module on the world stream, we also touched into. And then the fourth module is on the healing power of dream. And that is I work with dreams in relation to physical health and physical well-being. And we talk about what's called the healing sanctuary, which I also cultivated and developed here in Santa Barbara and a number of places in the country where people can work with dream like the old Asclepian tradition, Greek mythology and actual Greece. Um, and that is working with dreams in relation to physical illness. And that's been very cool. Medicines of the soul. That's what we call that. Dream tending that's the, area. the way to get there. Mm-hmm. That's an area I'm very interested in, and in dreams and wellness. And I, I'd like to hear, um, if you if you don't mind, a little bit more about your history, because you're a founder of Pacifica Graduate Institute. Uh, and and can you tell us a little bit about how dreams uh, helped shape Pacifica and your collaborations with colleagues such as Joseph Campbell and James Hillman and Marion Woodman? Oh, well, that brings a soft spot to my heart. <laughs> yeah. They were dear, dear, dear colleagues. And, uh, you know, I was coming out of uh, UCLA at at the beginning, then went over to UCSB, University of California at Santa Barbara, and and didn't have a job. You know, it was was in the time of Vietnam and consciousness raising and, you know, the human potentials movement. And uh, it was important. So many of my friends were returning vets, to be honest about it, and uh, hurting deeply hurting and you know what do you do what do we do it's like in the world of today what do we do how do we take constructive action and what i did was i needed a job number one so i went to the job center and saw on the board that there was a possibility of getting a work study position which i did and they said look you know you're living in the community ala vista right next to the university there's lots of upheaval do something and uh, so i started a Community Counseling Center, which was wonderful. It all started there. And at that Community Counseling Center, I started a dream group, right? And then one thing led to the next, and that became a paraprofessional program. We worked with the community with skills. We weren't licensed clinicians at that point. I mean, now I'm a licensed marriage family therapist, clinical psychologist, credential teacher, and all the rest. But back then, no, you know? And um, so we worked with basic skills that we knew would be helpful, reflective listening, how it is to develop empathetic regard and so on. Fast forward, um, that then became a extended program, a certificate program. Then it became a master's of arts in counseling psychology program, all with this idea of dream. And then I met Joseph. I met Joseph Campbell up at a place called Eslin on the Big Sur coast. And then Marion, Marion Woodman, who I met and, you know, these folks, I was just so deeply touched by, and they all made it a point because they so loved and believed in the idea of dream and imagination and what we're doing at Pacifica with depth psychology and mythology. And then I met James Hillman, and that really, I think, was probably the most essential shape shifting experience in relation to Pacifica because he brought in the idea of the anima mundi, the world's psyche, the world's soul, and the motto of Pacifica. Anima Munde Kalende Grati, for the sake of tending psyche in and out the world. It's dream based, dream based. And you know, I would always watch dreams. So, how did Pacifica evolve from that little place in Ala Vista, two rooms in an apartment, to now two big campuses here in the Santa Barbara area? It evolved to watching dream, to be part of dream and, and following the dream time, truly. 
I mean, where there are ups and downs and emotional appeal and all kinds of stuff and complexity. Of course, of course. And to I followed the through line of dream with help of extraordinary others. And then was in consultation with Joseph Campbell and James Hillman and Marion Woodman and so many others, Robert Johnson and a number of contemporaries in the field um, that have graced the place of Pacifica and has made Pacifica, they, many, collective, has made Pacifica uh, what it is today. The contributions of so many elders and so many esteemed professors and more important and most important, the extraordinary gifts of students and alumni as they um, open their own work and, and give back. So it's it's been a journey. People ask me, how did you know back then what it was going to be? What vision were you following? What, you don't know. I know for new. I was following something that was invisible, just the push that comes from inside one step at a time. And, um, you know, Pacifica then gets birthed and a lot of hard work and a lot of collaboration with a lot of really fine people. And um, it's evolved into the camps that it is today, which, by the way, is thriving, which is really good news. That sounds like an amazing journey. And you've been yeah, working at this and collaborating with these people for, for decades. And did you say you met Joseph Campbell at Esalen? Yeah, I met Joseph at Esalen. It was great. You know, he was um, in the dining hall there. And to be honest about it, a lot of, of young women that were just gathering around him. And he would just entertain and tell stories and talk myth. And, you know, he was a professor at Sarah Lawrence for decades and decades. So he's very familiar with that kind of interaction, talking story, gathering people around. Him. And then we became friends. I mean, I don't want to overstate that. It started with me just meeting him. And then something sparked in our conversation. And I invited him down, not to Pacifica. I invited him to Isla Vista that little community counseling center, and he came down. And for years, he would come down twice a year. And then he retired, and then it became more frequent from Sarah Lawrence. And, you know, the untold story is he was so generous with me and with what we were doing, what we believed in, that, frankly, he would leave virtually all the money back then with us so that we could evolve the school. Um, he was great, you know, extraordinary friendship. It was wonderful to be with him, to... Um, learn from him as so many people have and to host him and he would offer his you know lectures filled with uh, what he was using then slides if you can imagine with all these mythic references he was a master teacher in, in those ways so learned a great great deal from him and the mythological studies program at pacifica to this day roots back in his work and his library and his collections are at pacifica so the archives and collections are at Pacifica Graduate Institute, as are Marion's, and frankly, jo uh, James Hillman's are as well. So these people have been great elders of the school and uh, a pleasure to be with them, really. And for me, because I was in my early 20s to late 20s when I was with Joseph, and then I'd visit him in his place in Hawaii, and I'd go visit you know, his wife in uh, New York City. So it was an extraordinary learning experience for me personally. It brings a smile to my face and my heart warms. Yeah, I'm smiling now. I mean, what, what touching memories. That's really awesome. Yeah. And, uh, you know, before we wrap up completely here, I'm wondering if, if you could share with us just some final words about dreams and dreaming, as I know they've been so powerful and a source of guidance in your life. What would you just say to anyone who, if you had a few minutes just to talk about the power of dreams, what would you share? Yes, um, and I'm going to riff right off of where you ended, the power of dreams. Uh, extraordinary dreams. They evoke imagination. They're sourced in imagination from the beginning. So if we bring ourselves into relationship with dreams, we befriend the figures and the images and the landscapes of dreams rather than so quickly dismissing them or trying to get rid of them or analyzing them or interpreting them. All that's helpful. It is. And two, if we befriend them and get curious, the word that I would use that's most helpful is curiosity. If we bring our curiosity and we bring our sense of play and imagination in relationship to dream, something different happens. In dream tending, we have a saying, a dream loves to be met in the way of a dream. A dream loves to be met in the way of dream or poetry, the poetics of imagination. Not so much the critic or the the interpreter, you know, just think of an artist. When the critic comes, the artist goes the other way. But when the artist is met 
by a person that has an aesthetic, a sense of the artistic possibility, ah, then the conversation opens and deepens. So for those folks that are thinking about working with dream or that have done that for a long time, um, you know, meet the dream from a place, a dream centered place. Dream loves to be met in the dream. And I would think that's the, the word that I would offer most importantly. Get curious, befriend the dream, listen in. They have stories to tell. And I think I, what I would leave it with is this. What I've discovered for myself personally, personally and the many people that I've worked with, each dream, the figures, the characters, landscapes, they all have stories to tell. More often than not, we want to tell the story about them. But it is extraordinary when we take the time to bring a witness in presence and the immediacy of experience, presence, listening, seeing, in a way that allows the dream images to speak on behalf of themselves and tell their stories. Because then we have access to guidance and the wisdom and the imagination that is perhaps beyond and our own and certainly sources and mentors us. It's said that the figures and images and dreams, they develop, evolve or individuate, they do. And then as a result, we're implicated in our own sense of evolution or our own sense of what's called in psychology, individuation. We evolve, images come forward, present themselves, they evolve and in turn, they invite us into our sense of development or evolution. Thank you. Perfect final words. Um, I know that people will want to get a hold of you, and I believe they can do so at dreamtending.com as well as specifica.edu. Yes, both work. Um, the dream work, go to dreamtending.com. You'll mainline right into my work. If you go to pacifica.edu, particularly if you're interested in the graduate degree, that's really wonderful. And two, you'll always see in the Pacifica public programming, you'll see something involving me, my work, and dream work. So either way is great, yeah. Well, it's been so great to spend time with you today. Thank you for being yes. here, Stephen. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you. <laughs>